A timeline for life on Earth looks like this. Around 4.5 billion years ago, the planets of the solar system condensed from a cloud of dust and gas, most of which became the central body, the Sun. The earliest datable rocks containing signs of microbial life are found 3.5 billion years ago. During the first billion years, life appeared, about here. Conditions that produced the earliest life forms were water, solar radiation, and a witch's brew of chemicals that mix and react, producing all kinds of organic compounds. This primordial soup not only gave rise to the earliest organisms, it supplied them with nutrition. As microbes developed more efficient ways of reproducing, they quickly overran their food supply. Organic molecules were simply being broken down faster than they were being made. We imagine this harvest to depletion occurring over a relatively short period, about here. With molecular food running short, organisms that could obtain energy from inorganic sources, such as the abundant sulfur compounds dissolved in Earth's waters, would have a great advantage. However, it takes an initial input of energy to break down these inorganic compounds. And that energy came from light. You can find bacteria today that may be descendants of those early light harvesters. Bacteria that use hydrogen sulfide and the energy from light to make their own food molecules. These bacteria use light energy to split hydrogen sulfide, yielding sulfur, a waste product, and two particles that can be used in energy transactions, hydrogen ions and energetic electrons. The energy carried by the electron is sufficient to drive the synthesis of the universal energy carrier, NADPH. NADPH supplies energy for the reactions that turn carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. Electrons are powerful energy currency. Not only are they used to make NADPH, they are used in generating the cell's ultimate energy carrier, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. ATP supplies the energy that powers cell processes such as pumping nutrient molecules across the cell membrane, synthesis of new cell products, and cell movement. H2S was the first source of electrons and hydrogen ions for making energy carriers like NADPH and ATP. But electrons and hydrogen ions are also available from a substance that was far more abundant than H2S. H2O. The first organisms to carry out water-splitting photosynthesis appeared around two billion years ago. Cyanobacteria. Breaking down a water molecule provides hydrogen ions and energetic electrons. An atom of oxygen remains. One atom of oxygen combines with another to form O2, oxygen gas, which is given off as a waste. This waste gas was the beginning of today's oxygen-rich atmosphere. As oxygen became available, a new type of cell evolved a cell containing a nucleus and organelles. This cell type would become the building block of animals and plants, an evolutionary proliferation that began around here on life's timeline. Plants with stems, roots, and leaves appear here. Dinosaurs span this range, and mammals dominate this region. Our own species makes its appearance about here.
plant cells contain rounded green bodies called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts have DNA and reproduce themselves, supporting the theory that they were once independently living organisms, similar to the symbiotic algae cells living within a paramecium. A section through a chloroplast shows that it is composed of an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and stacks of thylakoid discs called grana. The surface of the thylakoid membrane is covered with chlorophyll molecules. Within each thylakoid is a hollow the thylakoid space. The region containing these structures is called the stroma. Each of these regions plays its own role in the reactions of photosynthesis. The reactions that make NADPH and ATP occur on the thylakoid membrane driven by light energy. The synthesis of organic molecules from CO2 occurs in the stroma using energy carriers provided by the light reactions. Light supplies the energy that drives photosynthesis. But not all wavelengths are equally effective. Chlorophyll molecules absorb energy most strongly in the red and blue regions of the spectrum. Green is reflected away, which explains why plants appear green. When light hits a chlorophyll molecule, the light energy raises one of the molecule's electrons to a higher energy level. If the same chlorophyll molecule was isolated in a solution, the excited electron would fall back, releasing its energy as visible light. Within a chloroplast, however, the thylakoid membrane contains energy acceptors, hungry for excited electrons, the proteins of the electron transport chain. Chlorophyll molecules are organized in a way that helps feed excited electrons to the electron transport proteins. Groups of several hundred chlorophylls form a light trapping antenna. The antenna channels excited electrons to a central chlorophyll called the reaction center. Picture a thylakoid dotted with collecting antennae. Bathed in sunlight, each group feeds streams of excited electrons to its reaction center. The reaction center chlorophyll channels the electron to proteins that use the electron's energy for work, specifically making ATP and NADPH. Another activity is going on among the swarms of chlorophyll molecules. Enzymes are splitting water molecules, releasing oxygen. Although its exact chemical details are not yet understood, the water splitting reaction is intimately coupled with the light trapping activities of chlorophyll, as this demonstration shows. Hydrogen ions released from water molecules play a role in the synthesis of the energy carriers, ATP and NADPH. This is how ATP is thought to be produced. As the excited electrons flow through the electron transport chain, they provide the energy needed to pump hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space, setting up conditions for chemiosmosis. The hydrogen ions diffuse back through an enzyme that uses the flow to generate ATP from ADP. Charging ATP by chemiosmosis is like filling a reservoir, the thylakoid, while letting the outflow pass through a generator, the enzyme, that charges a battery, ATP, that supplies the power for work. Although the electron transport chain uses most of its energy pumping hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space, some energy remains. 
The addition of light energy from another chlorophyll boosts the electron to an even higher energy level. It now has enough energy to make NADPH. The function of the light reactions is to make ATP and NADPH. These energy carrier molecules are used in the complex process of converting carbon dioxide into a three carbon compound from which other organic molecules can be assembled. The three carbon molecule, phosphoglyceraldehyde, P-gal, is synthesized in the stroma of the chloroplast through a series of reactions called the Calvin cycle. It takes nine ATPs and six NADPH energy carriers to drive the synthesis of one P-gal and much of this energy is stored in the P-gal molecule. Under the influence of enzymes in the stroma, molecules of P-gal are assembled into larger energy storage molecules such as starches and fatty acids. Exported into the cytoplasm, P-gal can be converted into six carbon sugars such as fructose and glucose. These fuel molecules are broken down in another cell organelle, the mitochondrion. Using oxygen, mitochondria strip fuel molecules of their energy, converting it into ATP. The waste product is carbon dioxide. The same molecule used by the chloroplast in the dark reactions of photosynthesis. <laughs> 